and welcome to the sixth talk in the Parkinson's Disease Foundation's sixth series of PDF expert briefings. Our topic today is a uh, very challenging, a very important one, the challenges of advanced Parkinson's and tips for better living. Um, I want to just express our thanks for PDF for uh, six collaborating regional groups that we have working with us on this series, um, the Houston Area Parkinson's Society, the Michigan Parkinson's Foundation, the Parkinson's Association of the Carolinas, the Parkinson's Association of the Rockies, and the Parkinson's Association and Parkinson's Support Center of Kentucky Honor. Um, so uh, we thank them uh, for their um, links to the, to the grassroots and their help in designing the series. They're very welcome partners to PDF. I also want to uh, thank our two sponsors, our corporate sponsors for this, uh, for this series this year, Abby Pharmaceuticals and Acadia Pharmaceuticals. Um, we're very, very um, grateful for the support of these fine companies. You all understand, of course, that though we have the benefit of their financial support and imprimatur, the editorial content of the series is entirely the responsibility of PDF and its uh, presenters and not of the company themselves. We welcome, we welcome their support and we appreciate their um, uh, uh, understanding the importance of this being entirely independent. We're very happy for that. Um, we have, just to remind you, we have the PowerPoint slide deck, which can be downloaded from the reminder email that you should have received this morning, or uh, alternatively, the PDF web page that highlights this talk. I should tell you that uh, we have almost 600, that's 600, uh, almost 700, I'm now informed, um, uh, uh, individuals participating in this uh, talk today uh, from, uh, we understand, 19 or 20 countries. Um, that are also uh, contributing uh, these uh, terrific people. So we welcome you all to this genuinely worldwide um, exchange. Um, for those of you who are uh, our health professional friends and qualify for a continuing education credit, uh, I'm advised that you are entitled to earn one free CEU, continuing education unit, through the American Society on Aging. So if you are on this call, if you're a health professional, if you've indicated that you'd like a CEU, you will receive an email by the end of the day today with steps on how you can collect it. Um, you've just 30 days until July 22nd to collect your CEU at that time. So it's now my very great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Peter Fletcher. Uh, he carries three degrees uh, after his name, MBCHB which is uh, the necessary graduate professional degrees in medicine and surgery and um, is the equivalent to the MD in the United States. And uh, interestingly, an MSD, Master of Science in Medical Education, which he means he comes here as a teacher as well as a scholar and a practitioner. He is a consultant physician in the Department of Old Age Medicine uh, in the Gloucestershire Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust in the United Kingdom. And uh, we're just delighted to, uh, to have him here. Um, I'm uh, not going to go uh, in detail to his resume. It may pop up during the course of the session. But um, it's uh, suffice it to say that he is a very eminent a person in his field and the field within a field that we're addressing today. And we're just thrilled that he could take time from what's now about 20-hour sunshine day in Britain. That is when the sun is shining in Britain, which is by no means always, um, to, uh, to join us uh, for this uh, midday in eastern uh, in New York time uh, 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 seminar today. So welcome, Dr. Fletcher. He will speak for about 20, 25 minutes, maybe a bit more. And then after that, we'll have... Um, those of you who have been uh, enjoying these things in the past will have a series of questions. We'll try and get through all of them in an hour. If we fail to, to complete them, we will try and uh, uh, meet the, the, uh, answer the balance of them following the session. Dr. Fletcher, the floor is yours. Thank you very much again, and uh, welcome to our session. Well, hello, Robin, and thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, my thanks to the Parkinson's Disease Foundation for inviting me to speak. It's a, it's a great pleasure. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joining us on the call. Um, I have looked at the past participants, and I understand that the majority are usually people with Parkinson's and those close to them, uh, their uh, carers, their family, uh, and those who um, uh, are on the same journey. 
Um, I think, though, that there's probably quite a bit in this talk that will be of interest to allied health professionals and nurses uh, and also to doctors. Uh, as Robin has said, I'm a specialist in old age medicine, but my subspecialty within it uh, is Parkinson's disease and movement disorders. So I tend to see uh, patients, patients, people with Parkinson's who have more advanced disease um, and therefore have the multiple problems associated with it. And the first thing I think it's important to point out is that isn't it wonderful that we are talking about uh, advanced Parkinson's disease, the idea that um, somebody can actually get to the stage where they have advanced Parkinson's disease is truly revolutionary in terms of uh, what was the case many years ago. Um, I called it a triumph of survival and it reflects perhaps the increased longevity particularly in the Western world. Um, if we go back to the um, time of James Parkinson, he described the shaking palsy in 1817 and at that time life expectancy in London was probably around 42 and in the rest of the United Kingdom and North America it was probably considerably less than 40. So he was describing a condition that becomes commoner with advancing age at the time when not that many people were of advanced age. And that's maybe why it took until 1817 to describe it. It was many decades later that uh, Charcot re uh, christened the disease the shaking palsy. Certainly, if you look at the incidence and prevalence of Parkinson's disease with increasing age, there will be more new cases in the seventh decade than one will see in the fourth decade. But because of increasing survival, those that uh, contract Parkinson's disease in the fourth and fifth decades are increasingly likely to live on longer. So if I look at my population, which tends to be over the age of 70, I will see many more people with Parkinson's disease uh, in uh, 2015 than I saw when I first became a specialist uh, 25 years ago. The world has changed. Parkinson's disease is often thought of as being a neurological condition, and certainly there are gold standard changes on histology that one can see in the brain that reflect the death of cells in a particular area involved in motor control, and as a result of that, deficiencies in the chemical neuro uh, dopamine. And it's not just the absolute deficiency, it's the change in the ratio of dopamine to other neurotransmitters. Uh, Whether it's a neurological disease in terms of etiology is, of course, a moot point, and there are theories that suggest it may be a disease that's caused by an infectious agent that incubates for some decades before traveling through the neurone system, neuro uh, neurological system up to the brain, uh, and indeed maybe it originates in the gastrointestinal tract. This is speculative. What is certainly true is that as the condition becomes more advanced, the range of symptoms become more variable. And I, as a geriatrician, think of Parkinson's as a multi-system disease. As we will see, it affects many different parts of the body in terms of the symptoms that it produces. The other thing to say is that the clock is ticking. We are getting older as each day goes by, and disease and everything else that we experience is painted on a canvas of normal aging, and aging is perfectly normal. It's something that happens biologically, and medicine uh, deals with the disease as it presents in, in the person as they get older. It's incredibly variable between individuals. Many of my patients say to me, well, I don't seem to be looking like the person who was next to me in the waiting room. How can that be when we've both got Parkinson's disease? I think one of the issues that we have to consider is that Parkinson's disease is different in different people, but people are different in the first place. Just let's go to um, uh, a consideration that we need to think about. If we look at um, 100 five-year-olds, in terms of physiological function, they all cluster about a mean fairly tightly. If we look at people who are much older, perhaps 75 or so, then the range of physiological parameters is much broader. So the difference between someone who is 80 but looks 60, and someone who is 60 look, but looks 80, is quite wide. And this is um, work that's come out of something called the Baltimore Study, which began in 1950s and is ongoing. But what it does is give us permission to understand that aging causes heterogeneity. There's a huge breadth of what is normal for one's age. So we start from the uh, premise that Parkinson's disease is unique to the individual, 
but the individual starts by being unique in the first place. And that's something that we have to consider when we look at people with a disease that is ticking away uh, year on year. And we need to remember that Parkinson's disease does not progress over days and weeks. It progresses over years and decades. If into that mix we now add comorbidities, so there are other causes of slowness and stiffness. People, as they get older, develop arthritis, for example. Um, they may develop shakiness due to treatment for obstructive pulmonary disease or heart failure or even develop essential tremor, then there is an added set of pictures that are painted on that canvas. And I rather like an expression that I um, use in many talks, which is it's not the age, bearing in mind the age doesn't necessarily predict how someone looks, but it's the mileage. It's this concept of a motor car that's been driven for uh, hundreds of thousands of, or tens of thousands of miles and uh, is looking uh, a little bit um, uh, less good than when it first came out of the showroom. It's a wonderful quote. Um, it doesn't come from an eminent professor of gerontology. It actually comes from Indiana Jones in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and uh, I've shamelessly pocketed it for use in talks. Um, if we consider all the things that can happen to us as we get older, some things can be cured, uh, infections. Some things can be ameliorated. They can be helped by um, supportive treatments, again, uh, respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, uh, and some things we can find ways of living with, and we'll, we'll come back to those. Two things that I want to just touch on very quickly are things that are common as we get older and something that perhaps crosses over in some ways with Parkinson's disease. On the whole, hearing issues are not a feature of Parkinson's, although many people with Parkinson's will accuse their spouses, their families of becoming deaf because, of course, the voice does become quieter in Parkinson's. People with Parkinson's can sometimes appear deaf because they often lose body language. They lose that upper body kinesia that illustrates or demonstrates or underpins what they're actually saying um, with their quietened voices. So the fluent, fluid movements of body language are sometimes lost. So hearing can be a bit of an issue. I think if there's any issues around hearing, and hearing does become uh, more impaired as we get older, we usually lose high frequency, then uh, an, an exam from a specialist would be uh, indicated um, such causes as uh, accumulation of wax and other uh, outer ear uh, problems are common as we get older and are easily uh, put right. There can be problems with middle ear disease, which can sometimes be treated. There may be sensory loss, problems with the way in which the uh, neurons conduct. But just a little word of warning um, for the person who has tried multiple hearing aids to no success. Sometimes what the pro where the problem lies is with central processing. It may be that the hearing is intact, but the brain is not actually taking in the impulses and processing them in a meaningful way. Now, that can sometimes herald a uh, diagnosis of cognitive impairment, which we'll come to a little bit later, but it can sometimes flag that as something that itself needs investigating, and that's a very different ballpark to uh, sorting out hearing. I would argue that it's always better to know where the problem lies so that it can be dealt with rather than putting the, uh, brushing it under the carpet. Uh, in an earlier talk, you've already heard about eyesight issues, and eyesight is particularly important in Parkinson's because of the predilection of people with Parkinson's to fall. Now, the fact that people fall, to me, is often not such a surprise as we stand up in the first place. It's, you think about all the anatomy and physiology that lies behind standing up, it seems a very improbable prospect, particularly to do so on just two legs. If we lose any prompts, any clues, uh, any uh, ability to improve our balance, such as through the loss of eyesight, then we are putting ourselves at risk. There are well-described eyesight problems in um, some of the uh, atypical syndromes that look like Parkinson's. They can also occur in Parkinson's itself, and there's been a couple of papers recently in the Movement Disorders Journal looking at that. But you know, common things are common, and as we get older, there are certain things that will impair our eyesight, which we would do better to address rather than, than ignore. And so most of my patients with Parkinson's, I advise to have an annual eye check at an optometrist. And the specific things that they're looking for are refraction. Do they need a change in the prescription of their glasses? And that's an interesting one because 
some of my patients find that if they're wearing bifocals or very focals, the tendency to fall over is greater. If they replace those glasses with a set for reading and a set for distance, the tendency to fall is less. The problem being that we tend to look down when we're, for example, walking downstairs, and if we're looking through the reading bit, we're much more likely to fall over. Um, so refraction and keeping the visual acuity absolutely crisp is very important in trying to prevent falls. Probably the most successful operation we do in the Western world is cataract extraction. It can revolutionize people's lives. A regular check from an optometrist can see as the, cat the cataract maturing and will um, diagnose the point at which perhaps extraction would be uh, wise and indicated. It's a fabulous operation. Uh, my patients come back to me and say that the greens have become green and the reds have become overpoweringly red and just the clarity of vision is absolutely phenomenal. Very, very inspirational stuff and, and worth doing. And again, an optometrist will pick that up. I think one of the common and missed causes of reversible blindness in older age is glaucoma. It's very easy to detect and very simple to treat and should not be missed. Um, a simple examination, pressure tests will help, and there's now a, a laser tomography scan available which can sometimes uh, give you a baseline as to um, whether changes are occurring. And there are other causes of hearing in, uh, of eyesight impairment, um, some of them not so treatable like um, dry macular degeneration, but some of them partially treatable like um, wet um, macular degeneration. Again, common things are common, and in the setting of Parkinson's can be absolutely um, vital in terms of lowering the risk of falls. So some learning points. The special senses, hearing and eyesight, I think are crucial in advanced Parkinson's disease because they can help offset some of the problems that advanced Parkinson's brings. I recommend an annual eye check. Um, I don't think an annual hearing check is necessary, but I think if there's any suspicion, um, it's worth doing. But beware deafness for which hearing aids do not work. It may be that the cognition has to be assessed, and that would lead to a different management plan than if it was the hearing. I want to move on to something that I see very commonly, which is confusion in people getting older. Now, for me, uh, confusion is rarely due to what my junior doctor sometimes brings to me, which is a case of somebody with an acute worsening of Parkinson's. Parkinson's disease can get worse acutely, but it's extremely rare, and there are uh, relatively few specific causes for that. The canary in the mine shaft was what miners used to use for carbon monoxide detection because canaries are more sensitive to, to it than men. So it was all early warning. And for me, confusion in people getting older with Parkinson's is an early warning that there is something else going on. Let me just explain what I mean. I think the lay public often think that confusion is a manifestation of getting older. Well, it's certainly true that confusion is commoner in people as they get older, and certainly the threshold for confusion is set lower as we get older. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to become confused. It's also true that disease is commoner as we get older, and once again, if we have any form of disease, it's likely to set the threshold lower for the onset of confusion. If we add into the mix prescribed drugs or indeed um, even recreational drugs such as alcohol, again, we lower the threshold for confusion and we can inadvertently set up a situation where confusion becomes more likely. Now, you can see where I'm going with this. If you stack those three things up together, you come perilously close to a threshold beyond which confusion is not likely to occur or is commoner but will occur. And if we put something very simple on top of that, like a urinary tract infection, for example, then the patient suddenly, apparently, becomes confused. The urinary tract infection is the thing that has caused the confusion, but the age and the disease and the drugs have been the underlying features that have made it more likely. So let's just have a quick look at those issues in terms of learning points. It's good to age well and Aging can be manipulated by keeping the calorie count down, um, also important in advanced Parkinson's because people who are lighter rather than heavier are less likely to fall over, 
less likely to damage themselves and more able to get up off the floor if they do fall. Exercise is critically important both in terms of keeping the weight down but also in terms of keeping the strength and the fluidity of movement up. So we can modify the way in which we age and we can more likely become that 80 year old who looks 60 than the 60 year old who looks 80. Chronic disease is really important to manage. It is inevitable that some of us will experience heart failure or obstructive pulmonary disease or diabetes but those conditions can all be managed. They may not be curable but they can be managed in a way that minimizes the impact uh, on uh, anyone who has them and specifically someone uh, who has another chronic disorder such as Parkinson's. That said, and I would say this wouldn't I as a card carrying geriatrician, I minimize medication, all medication, um, prescribed medication included. If I look at a, a drug chart, every drug has to earn its keep. Um, I think that's usually true in uh, the drugs we use in Parkinson's, uh, but sometimes we need to for example, consider why we're using statins in a 95-year-old, um, and there are other conundrums that we really do have to uh, uh, deal with. So be alert to acute destabilizing scenarios, and the advice I give to uh, my patients is if you feel that there's any evidence you're developing an infection, and in Parkinson's that can often be a chest infection, sometimes related to the swallowing uh, problems that we face with advanced uh, disease, uh, but it might be a urinary infection, then talk to your primary care physician immediately and you may well need antibiotics. The person with Parkinson's who is becoming slowed up and breathless but the disease doesn't appear to have worsened and remember again it worsens over years and decades not over um, hours and days then maybe there's a secondary diagnosis maybe there's a, a pulmonary embolus or some other cause of oxygen not entering the bloodstream as effectively as it should. Drugs, prescribed drugs, um, and this is why I like to minimize medication. Um, the addition of a drug that is, uh, 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 for example, an old-style depressant, antidepressant or an old-style antihypertensive, these can lower the threshold for confusion. But remember also that the omission, not taking a drug that is normally taken, for example, for anxiety or agitation, can also lead to confusion. So it's the right drug at the right time for the right condition. Let's move on. It is a given, I think, that quality of life is intensely personal, that the things that cause a reduction in quality of life are very bespoke and individual. They are multiple, usually in Parkinson's, and they can be motor problems or they can be non-motor problems. But again, they are, if you will, the... Uh, province of the person who has the condition and as such they um, define how they're going to um, uh, consider their quality of life. What we can be sure of is that assuming the person with Parkinson's lives on for some years and they usually do these days which is fantastic, the disease will progress and if we think about normal um, loss of brain cells, then that does occur um, with normal aging. If we think about the cells that are lost in Parkinson's disease, they decline rather more rapidly, and that will occur with differing uh, arcs of deterioration over differing lengths of time in different people. And if we think of that slide representing function, so uh, let's think of um, the get up and go test, how quickly you can get up and walk. And in normal aging, it's the black line, but in Parkinson's, it's the red line. Then our drugs are all about trying to close the gap between the two lines. Early on in Parkinson's disease, the gap is quite small. But in more advanced disease, the gap is much bigger. And therefore, we see the use of more and more drugs, um, three, four different classes of drug to try and bring about as normal a function as possible. Now that said, there is inevitably an accumulation of problems as time goes by. And it begs the question, what symptoms increase with time? One of the good things that have come out of the last few years of research is an increasing number of studies that have looked at the various problems that occur 20 years on. 
a recent study by Parkinson's UK suggests that these are, from the point of view of the person with Parkinson's, such priorities as balance and falls, stress and anxiety, uncontrollable movements, dementia, mild thinking, memory problems, sleep, dexterity, urinary problems, a whole raft of things that people with advanced Parkinson's identify as being the things that affect their quality of life. I'm going to show you a couple of slides from a study called the Sydney Multicenter Study of Parkinson's Disease. This was published in the Movement Disorders Journal in 2008 and comes from Healy et al. from Sydney. Um, they've published interim studies along the way with the same set of patients going through over time. And it gives us some clues as to the kinds of things that progress over time. Uh, there are other 20-year studies out. There's one from Innsbruck and there's, um, there's a couple more. But uh, these are really the way forward in terms of telling us what the natural history of Parkinson's disease is. So take a look at this uh, slide. I'm sorry it's a little bit blurred. If you look at the vertical axis on the left, that's really going from 0 to 100. So at the starting point, 100% of patients. Going from left to right is quite simple. That's years uh, going from 0 to 25. And at each point, what we have is the number or the percentage of patients still alive who don't have the problem concerned. So we start at 100%. So here, for example, the bottom line represents first fall, and at 13 years of those still alive, half have not fallen. Half have, but half haven't, which I think is really encouraging. If we go to the top line, that's the first fracture, and interestingly, at 13 years, that figure is something like 80% of those left alive have not fractured which tells you a little bit about people with Parkinson's and how they fall, that they can fall quite a lot, but they don't necessarily fracture. And I think one of the explanations for that, and I think many people with Parkinson's uh, on, on the line will recognize this, is that people with Parkinson's tend to fall front back. They tend to fall on their face or on their back. If you reach down and feel the side of your thigh, you can feel the head of your femur. That's very exposed. If you fall on that, you need something like a 20th of the force to crack it that you would need if you fell flat on your face and flat on, flat on your back. So there's something about the way in which people with Parkinson's fall with advanced disease that dictates whether they're going to fracture or not. And there is some emerging evidence from the 20-year data that that is indeed the case. So uh, learning points are to avoid falling if one can, and um, a lot of centers run... Um, uh, falls uh, clinics to try and minimize the chances of falling. Simple things such as not having rugs, uh, avoiding um, small children and other obstacles, um, and um, trying to maintain strength to, to prevent the falling. But fall with care. Be aware of the direction in which one falls. And also be aware of the situations in which falls are more likely to occur. My patients with Parkinson's tell me that uh, they are at their most vulnerable when they're turning, so taking multiple steps to go through 180 degrees or even 90 degrees, and I think that's probably true for all of us. But one of the things that they particularly uh, find particularly difficult is if they're distracted. So the nightmare is if someone calls across the street, hey, Bill, and he turns very rapidly and falls over because his body can't keep up with what his mind wants him to do. So uh, be aware of the things that precipitate fall. Protection is something that's increasingly being uh, appreciated. So there are hip protectors, for example, that are used in certain situations. I have to say many people with Parkinson's don't like them particularly. Um, but bone health protection, um, in many countries there are osteoporosis uh, diagnosis and prevention programs. There is emerging evidence that um, people with Parkinson's are more prone to osteoporosis as one perhaps would expect from reduced mobility, and therefore they should be scanned or at least treated maybe with vitamin D and calcium and bisphosphonates and second-line drugs. On the previous uh, slide, there is evidence that the uh, number of people um, without low blood pressure falls over the 20 years, so maintaining a, a good blood pressure is important, and having blood pressure checked is important when you see your specialist. My patients think I'm a little bit bonkers because when they come to see me, I check their blood pressure and I tell them I'm checking it to make sure it's not too low, whereas when they go to their primary care physician, he or she checks it to make sure it's not too high. And, of course, 
uh, we know that Parkinson's will drop your blood pressure as will its medication. So if you're on antihypertensives, particularly when you get into the advanced disease phases, it's important to know what your blood pressure is doing. Poor swallowing, uh, again, follows a similar uh, trail, and um, we've touched on it briefly already with respect to an increased chance of chest infections. The slightly alarming slide from the Sydney 20-year study is the one that deals with dementia and hallucinations. Now, if we look at the 50% uh, point, which occurs at 15 years, what this tells us is that half of all those who make it to 15 years have and have not got dementia and have and have not got hallucinations. So 50% have got f dementia, 50% haven't, 50% have got hallucinations, 50% haven't. And I think the fact that half remain free of dementia or hallucinations and or hallucinations at 15 years is a very positive message. Many of my patients are very worried that they might develop cognitive impairment and the fact that um, uh, a sizable proportion do not remember again that this is a condition that worsens with age anyway is, is, is I think encouraging. So what can we say about dementia? Well it's a common syndrome as we get older anyway. It has many causes and as you know the commonest cause is Alzheimer's disease, a global dementia affecting all aspects of the way the brain works. And from the world of Alzheimer's comes the concept of mild cognitive impairment. That's um, problems with the way in which the brain is thinking, reasoning, um, judging, but without necessarily full-blown dementia. Cognition is impaired in Parkinson's, and there's a specific type of dementia that does occur in Parkinson's. But equally, other causes are available, which include Alzheimer's, vascular disease, and so on. Hallucinations, we should just be clear what we mean by that. Illusions, I would argue, are something we all get. If I walk through the woods near my home and I see uh, what I think is a deer and I get closer and it's actually a bush, that's an illusion. If I think I've seen a deer and there's no bush there, then that's probably a visual hallucination. And delusions are a much more complex belief system around what might be going on and, and, and uh, involves many, many um, brain-generated stimuli. Hallucinations are usually in the advanced stage and they're virtually always visual. The Parkinson sets the scene but the drugs unmask them. So I'm often asked, is it the disease or is it the drugs? Well, it's the two put together. Medication is available that will control hallucinations, but if it's necessary, I go very slow with low doses. But I often find that in advanced disease, reducing some of the medication is often a better approach, sometimes even ending up on just levodopa and, and dropping some of the more potent but um, prone to side effects types of medication. As ever, there's a balancing act between immediate quality of life and symptom relief and side effects and complications. And I would add that that's not always just the person with Parkinson's. Sometimes the caregiver has a, a, a view as well which needs to be taken into consideration. So finally, to understand the benefits of living life to the full today, while making careful plans for what will happen um, uh, in the longer term, and I don't think the two are mutually exclusive, I think dealing with the former can help inform the latter. The way in which I think people with Parkinson's can improve their uh, uh, ability to manage and also set up things for the longer term is firstly to consider who have they seen. So primary care physician, men in particular not always very good at going to the doctor, but going to the physician, primary care physician is a good way of getting on to a specialist. That specialist may be a geriatrician, a psychiatrist or a neurologist, depending on the symptoms with which the person with Parkinson's presents. In my practice, once the diagnosis is made, the key worker is in fact the Parkinson's nurse specialist, um, an absolutely invaluable central point to managing uh, my patients. But thereafter, the occupational therapist who can get the patient into, the person with Parkinson's into good practice, which will be good for now, but also good for the future. People like health visitors, um, physiotherapists, again physio, getting person, people into good practice for the short and for the long run. Clearly, um, there are others involved. Um, primary care have their own nurses. I think the, uh, 
pharmacist um, and others, the psychologist. These are all important people in terms of keeping the, um, the person with Parkinson's uh, absolutely in tip-top condition. Speech and language therapy, we think of speech and language therapists as dealing with the speech problems of Parkinson's, but they can also be invaluable in dealing with the swallowing problems of Parkinson's. And I have a very low threshold for referral on to um, my colleagues in that specialty. Don't undervalue the voluntary sector. Um, I work very closely with Age UK, Parkinson's UK and the Cure Parkinson's Trust. And a very good example of that in North America is, of course, the Parkinson's Disease Foundation. Um, these are all invaluable organizations in helping to support the person with Parkinson's and also help their critical significant others, the family, the friends, the carers. These are the people that underpin the person with Parkinson's disease. And um, I think, again, getting people into good practices early on maximizes quality of life in the short term, but also uh, means that everything is there for the longer run too. With advancing age, we have to accept that in some cases people with advanced disease will end up in a care facility, but that need not be such a negative uh, outcome. I took this picture at a care institution I visit fairly often. It's a particularly good one. I love visiting it. People there are very animated. The care staff are fantastic. And these are the activities that range from Monday to Sunday um, and down the left-hand side from morning to evening. And, yep, three of them are about exercise, which is good, but there's other things that are cognitively stimulating, dominoes, story reading, um, films, one-to-one um, -one discussions with the staff, home baking, and so on. Uh, it looks like they get Friday morning off, which is quite nice. Um, if I were to reach for a single intervention to make a difference to the lives of people with advanced Parkinson's, it would quite simply be this, physical exercise. And it's exactly the same response I would have to if someone said to me, what's the single most important intervention you can make to people as they get older? So physical exercise comes in many forms. Um, you've already had a session on this earlier in the program, um, which looks at kind of strengthening exercises on the one hand and what I think of as postural stability exercises on the other. There's no doubt that walking is what the body does and therefore the more walking that we can do the better. Um, there's good evidence that it helps with falls prevention, particularly if it's associated with um, strengthening exercises. Um, dexterity is very important. We think of um, the lower body, but what the hands can do is very important. And um, gardening is a very popular hobby among older people in the UK. I suspect it's true in other countries too. Dancing is an interesting one because dancing is often a skill that's well retained in people with Parkinson's because of the musical and, and, and rhythm elements to it. Um, it also involves uh, spatial awareness and cognitive uh, stimulation as well, particularly if new dances are being learned. Uh, dancing undergoing quite a big renaissance in the UK at the moment, which is great. Of the physical exercises for postural balance, uh, the biggest evidence base uh, comes from Tai Chi, a uh, super paper from Oregon in 2012 by Lee and colleagues recently um, re-published uh, in an updated form in the Movement Disorders Journal. But yoga and Pilates, again, about postural awareness, strength, um, in, in the sense of maintaining position rather than brute strength. I mentioned the gymnasium in the context of most gymnasiums, you, you, you get a personal trainer as well. So if you like, this is a bespoke person who can take you through specific exercises which you feel that you can manage uh, rather than doing something more generic. So I, I put it in uh, because many uh, gymnasiums will now have uh, half days or sessions for people um, with medical conditions and or who are getting older. One of the commonest things I'm asked about in um, advanced Parkinson's, just to finish off, is uh, driving. And um, it is certainly the case that the inability to walk as far as one used to shouldn't stop one driving. And the licensing authorities have their rules about what would preclude someone from driving. And it's usually not the motor problems. It's usually more to do with the cognitive problems. I have to say these European uh, badges look rather pedestrian compared to the American version. I think this chap in his wheelchair is really going for it. And I have to say I love the term reserved parking rather than disabled. That's a much more positive way of looking at it. Putting it all together, um, exercise, I think, can be looked at in four different ways. Physical exercise we've talked about. Mental exercise, the, the, the brain is not a muscle. You can't exercise it in that sense. 
But reading, Sudoku, crosswords, um, mental interaction with um, uh, uh, in, uh, things on the, on the net, all very useful. Psychological exercise, the relationships, um, family, friends, and social exercise, going out, um, being with other people, um, going outside the bubble of the house into other areas, I think are all ways of minimizing the impact of advanced Parkinson's disease on others, or on oneself, uh, by being with others. And, um, of course, one way of doing that is get a dog. Um, a lot of my patients have dogs. Um, many of those dogs get older with them, um, but they still provide great um, mental and psychological uh, um, input. And, of course, physical exercise is particularly uh, important because you've got to walk a dog twice a day. If the walking is perhaps not so good, then even the independently-minded cat can offer great comfort and uh, uh, um, stimulation to someone with advanced Parkinson's disease. So um, I'm very grateful to you for listening, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Professor. That was really a tour de force. <coughs> I personally learned a great deal. I'm sure our colleagues on the phone did too. Uh, my favorite witty line, which I've written down and will promise to remember forever, um, is, every drug must earn its keep. I, I just think it is simply wonderful. Quote it to everybody, including our friends in the pharmaceutical industry, who I'm sure know that for themselves. It's a very um, axiomatic thing and uh, beautifully put. Uh, that was a terrific uh, um, and a very uh, quick tour of such an important area, and we're very grateful for it. Um, I have a group of sort of symptom-by-symptom symptom questions, which I'm going to take, if I may, in order. Mm -hmm. um, they're all specific things, and we can run through them one by one. I'm sure in some cases the, uh, the answers will be quite, uh, be quite short. Um, first, the first has to do with constipation uh, and whether regular laxatives or any special laxatives are good for dealing with this extremely common problem. Um, constipation is part of the disease. Um, it's a given, and laxatives of any kind will resolve it eventually. I think the quick tip here is that rather than stop the laxatives, one should gradually reduce the dose. So um, I tend to use a, uh, Macrogols, either Movicol, um, um, there are others. But the, the trick there is that if it takes three sachets a day to resolve it, then perhaps come down to two sachets a day, one sachet a day, perhaps one sachet twice a week, whatever it takes to prevent what is part of the disease. And one last point about that is the bowel doesn't work well unless it's got an adequate amount of fluid in it. So sometimes it's a marker for not drinking enough. Thank you. Um, second, we have from a, a person from Ohio in the United States, uh, the question of apraxia, which is a motor speech disorder. And this person would like to know, Dr. Fletcher, how common is apraxia in Parkinson's? Apraxia. Apraxia. Yeah. Um, not as common as it is in other conditions, but um, it certainly can be a disabling problem, and it needs the input of the relevant therapist. So um, if it affects speech and language, then, again, it would prompt an early referral to a speech and language therapy. If it's uh, affecting a limb, then, again, I'd have a low threshold for an early referral to a physiotherapist. Or maybe if it's upper limb, uh, an occupational therapist. It depends how it's impacting, I would argue. Great. A question from Arizona. The symptom in this case is extreme fatigue. And uh, this person would like to know, um, I don't believe you spoke to gr at great length on this, so would you enlarge a little on the matter of fatigue and how one, that can be confronted while maintaining the patient's quality of life? Yeah, fatigue is a common um, observation for people with Parkinson's um, or even more common from their, from their spouses. Um, it's um, difficult to unravel. Um, apathy is sometimes misconstrued as fatigue. Apathy can again be a marker for cognitive impairment and it might be worth that being assessed. Sometimes it can be a marker for early depression and certainly depression should not be, um, should be uh, missed because that's very treatable, um, not necessarily with medication. There are other ways of dealing with it. My worry if someone presents with fatigue that was not previously there or it has suddenly worsened is, is there another diagnosis? And 
For example, um, restless legs is very well known association with Parkinson's disease, yet sometimes it's not the Parkinson's disease, the patient's actually anemic. So I, I think a thorough examination um, of looking for other things is, um, is indicated. At the end of the day, sometimes it just comes down to being part of the condition. Um, again, graded exercises, if the person's not capable of doing you know, full-on physio or gym-type exercises, then starting uh, with gentle ones and gradually building up. I'd look at nutrition, particularly if the person's carrying too much weight, they'll be going to be more fatigued more easily. So um, I'm afraid, Robin, so it's a range of things depending on what's actually underpinning it, but it is associated with PD. Hmm. Very helpful, very rich answer. Thank you. Um, uh, the problem from uh, reported in Florida has to do with violent movements, and the person from Florida would like to know, Dr. Fletcher, uh, is this likely a reaction to the medications in Parkinson's, or is it a part of, uh, of, of Parkinson's progression? Violent okay. movements often accompanied by vivid dreams. All oh, right. Now, I think those are two separate issues. The, the vivid dreams associated with movements of the limbs is part of usually part of something called REM behavioral disorder rapid eye movement behavioral disorder which tends to occur at night now when we dream we're normally paralyzed our brain no longer talks to the motor cortex and therefore to the limbs and we just lie there absolutely um, motionless for some reason in Parkinson's that does not occur so we act out our vivid dreams and this can be quite traumatic particularly for the bed partner um, they can uh, be thumped by the um, person with Parkinson's, not through any malice, but just because they're in the way. So nighttime, rapid movements, yes, I, I, I think that's very much part of the disease. More difficult are the dyskinesias, uh, so the writhing uh, movements that occur in advanced Parkinson's disease in people who have uh, a clear diagnosis of Parkinson's, in whom some years have gone by and for, who, for which they've been taking levodopa. If they've been taking a lot of levodopa, it's more likely. If they've been taking less levodopa, it's less likely. If they had a diagnosis made in their 40s and 50s, it's more likely than if they have a diagnosis made in their 60s and 70s. But the easy, quick way of reducing them is, I'm afraid, to reduce the levodopa, and therein lies the problem that function will suffer as a result unless some, of the, um, unless some of the loss of that medication can be made good by other classes of drug. In very difficult cases of dyskinesia, there's a drug called amantadine, which can sometimes be used, although I have to say in advanced disease in patients who are getting older, I think the side effects do often outweigh the benefits. So, again, a rather complicated answer to a, um, a, a very good question. Well, it's a very complicated question, so it deserves a complicated answer. You did very, very well. Um, thank you. Um, here's a case uh, of a stage 5 Parkinson's, uh, pers a person with stage 5 Parkinson's who experiences the very serious um, uh, problem uh, while eating of esophageal um, spasms. And uh, the uh, question here, is, uh, this is a rather arcane question, but obviously very important to this person, I'm sure to others too. Um, is, the, is, is esophageal dystonia sometimes involved in this? Uh, whether or not it is, is there any uh, easy or not easy way of preventing or treating this, uh, what can be obviously a devastating problem while eating? Ooh, um, so esophageal dystonia may respond to levodopa. Um, if this is stage 5 disease, then that is quite advanced disease in which swallowing will be an issue usually. Um, I, I rather flick past the swallowing slide uh, from the Sydney study, but um, a, a large majority of people um, at 20 years um, who survive with Parkinson's, um, not many are actually free of swallowing problems. Um, the the problem of esophageal dystonia is probably usually less common than problems with the swallowing reflex itself. Um, and the question then is how to maintain nutrition. Um, the use of feeding tubes is perfectly possible, but not always um, desirable. And that's a decision for the person with Parkinson's and the wider family to address. And in a sense, that's what I was getting at when I was talking about planning ahead. Um, physicians, nurses, therapists can do wonderful, wonderful things, but they mustn't do things that the patient doesn't want them to do. Of course. 
Uh, one more problem before I get to more general questions that have been asked. This uh, question is about falls. It comes from the state of New Jersey, United States. But it's a very practical question. Given what you were saying about the uh, difficulty of falling and the kind of falling that occurs with Parkinson's, is there anything very practical or sensible, like the use of a bike helmet, that you would ever recommend to deal with the risk of falls? Oh, yeah, right. Um, bike helmets are could be useful. Um, certainly um, children who fall a lot for various neuromuscular uh, disorders often wear helmets. Um, people with Parkinson's don't often bang their head, funnily enough. Um, certainly hip protectors are not widely used, but are well recognized as, um, uh, as means of protection. I recommend to my patients something that they don't like, which is that they move fairly early to a more substantive walking aid. Um, people have great faith in sticks um, until they realize that often sticks are more likely to make them fall over because they don't really offer support. They will offer support if, say, you've got a painful hip because you can offload through your arms. But in terms of postural stability, it's much better to have a three-wheel or four-wheel walker, ideally one with brakes, ideally one with a seat so you can actually have a rest. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very practical advice. Thank you very much. So if we may move from the specific questions about the particular symptoms that are troubling people to general questions, um, here, here's one that three people asked in very similar ways. It has to do with definitions of dementia and something, if you can enlarge a little on what you were saying during your talk, how does Parkinson's disease dementia differ uh, medically, symptomatically, and so forth from, on the one hand, um, Lewy body disease, and uh, on the other hand, uh, other dementias. Can you distinguish a bit more the, uh, the uh, differences between Parkinson's disease dementia and Lewy body disease and other dementias? Okay, so um, we'll start with the word dementia, which describes a clinical picture. So the progressive loss of cognition, um, so cognition being about memory, uh, thinking, judgment, perception, all those things that characterize us as sentient beings. Um, translating into difficulty in doing things, so not being able to recognize things, not being able to uh, interpret speech, not being able to um, do up um, buttons and things, not because of the Parkinson's, but because the memory banks can't remember how to do it. So dementia is a clinical syndrome. What underpins it is a series of other real diseases which you can define histologically at post-mortem and which in life sometimes give us clues because they affect different parts of the brain uh, differently. So the commonest is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's histology, the picture under the microscope, looks entirely different to the Parkinson's picture both in terms of the cellular changes and the distribution. Alzheimer's is a global dementia. It affects virtually all bits of the brain but particularly memory. Memory disappears very early um, and that's often the, pre the, the, the presenting uh, problem. Vascular dementia is probably the second commonest, and this is where people have what we might think of as tiny strokes affecting different parts of the brain. So as you can imagine, because different vessels are affected differently, it's a very patchy dementia, so it may affect memory, it may affect um, the um, frontal lobes, it may affect other bits of the brain, but it's, it's, it's patchy, it's different bits affected to different extents. The dementia associated with Lewy bodies, and that falls into the Parkinson's disease dementia and the cortical Lewy body disease, tends to affect the frontal lobes primarily and then the rest of the brain secondarily. So people with um, the dementia associated with this condition, um, and it is on a spectrum, which I'll explain in a moment, tend to have problems with what's called executive function. So getting up, walking across the room, making a cup of coffee, walking back is an example of executive chaining. Lots of little events put together to um, come back to the chair and realize that you've completed the task. Those sorts of planning and execution functions are very difficult if frontal lobe disease is present. It can also cause problems with emotional ability, a lowered threshold for things like impulse control disorder. These are all frontal functions which are particularly characteristic of the type of dementia associated with Parkinson's and Parkinson's-like conditions. In terms of the um, nomenclature, in terms of the labeling, somebody who's got advanced Parkinson's disease and then develops dementia has probably had the disease for at least 10 years, and that would be termed Parkinson's disease dementia. Someone who presents with dementia and then develops Parkinson's disease would probably be called cortical Lewy body disease.
Now, those extremes are relatively simple for the physician. The problem is the gray areas in between. But if you look at the appearances under a microscope, they are the same. Wonderful. That's a terrific answer. Thank you much, very much for that. Um, here's a question, a very general one, but uh, obviously affects everybody who was in the older years of Parkinson's. Um, asking you to remind us, uh, Dr. Fletcher, of how the progression of Parkinson's uh, differs at different decades of diagnosis. And the, the ones here, this person from Michigan and the second person from North Carolina, both asking a very similar question. Um, they've chosen 60 years diagnosis, diagnosis 70 years, and diagnosis 80 years. Could you give a very quick tour of how Parkinson's, uh, the, the uh, progression of Parkinson's will differ for those three people? That's a great question. One of the commonest questions I'm asked in clinic is, is my disease progressing about average or a bit quicker or a bit slower? Um, so um, it's very heterogeneous. So rather like the graphs I showed of aging as we get older, um, there is a huge spread. And certainly on one or two consultations, it's very difficult for me to predict what speed things are going at. And some people will progress quicker and some people will progress slower. What certainly seems to be the case, though, is that depending on the age of onset will depend the picture that one sees. So younger people, people diagnosed in their 40s and 50s, will live on for a decade, two decades, three decades, and are much more likely to develop dyskinesias because they have lived on for that long period of time. People with older onset disease may present with tremor, but they may present without a tremor. About 30% of people with Parkinson's don't have a tremor. And they may progress more rapidly because what seems to be the case is that the problems of advanced Parkinson's disease seem to become much, much commoner as we get into our late middle and late 70s, regardless of the age of onset. There's been a, a, a couple of studies looking at the way symptoms have developed regardless of age of onset, and it seems to be that those advanced features, no matter how many years have gone before, usually show up in the mid to late 70s. Um, quite unusual to see a new case of Parkinson's in, in, in the 80s, um, but it's perfectly possible, and again, that heterogeneity applies. But to have lived to the age of 80, most people presenting with Parkinson's in their 80s are actually biologically quite fit, <laughs> a different cohort, I think. Mm. Fascinating. Your point about uh, age being, in many cases, uh, more important than age of onset is uh, striking. It's totally mm. new to me. I want to think about that and uh, I'm sure chat with people here at PDF. Very, very helpful. Uh, two questions from people who seem to be um, um, unnaturally sophisticated in what Parkinson's is doing. We have quite a lot of those on this call, Dr. Pleasure. They're doing their graduate courses in something um, and they catch up with us or you later. Uh, this first one is from California. Somebody who's been studying uh, what we call marijuana in this country, cannabis in the UK, same thing. And uh, this, of course, has been very much in the news with Colorado, the state of Colorado now going public with um, uh, the availability for medical and other reasons uh, for uh, cannabis slash marijuana. And so this person is asking, do we, what do we know about the uh, connection between this, uh, uh, this chemical and, uh, and Parkinson's, and especially with respect to reducing pain in the body? Do you have a view of that? Um, I know of no good hard evidence. Um, this has been looked at, as you probably know, in multiple sclerosis, and although, again, there's no definitive um, proof, it is said to be better, sorry, it is said to be effective for both pain and for um, um, spasm, for rigidity. Um, yes, I've had patients who have tried uh, cannabis, marijuana, and they think it helps dystonia. Um, my worry is that it lowers the threshold for confusion. <laughs> And although it is mood, I mean, it's mood changing, it's said to be mood enhancing, but I think certainly for older patients, it can be uh, a lower threshold for confusion in a brain where that is already the case. Um, of course, it's so difficult to do the research because in most jurisdictions, it's illegal. Um, and therefore, certainly the MS studies that were done in the UK had to be done under a very special license. But um, I'm, never, I'm sure, I, I don't think we'll ever see the definitive research on this. Lots of anecdotes, so. Hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, and the other question in the category of uh, somebody who really knows a great deal about what's going on 
It's again from California, and it has to do with a new a drug for the U.S., but an old drug for the U.K., Duopa. It's been in the market uh, in the U.K. and the European Union for years and years, I think, many years, actually. And now it's being introduced in the U.S. as uh, Duopa. And um, your thoughts, um, this, this person wants to know, particularly because of where you practice um, and have, I'm sure, more extensive um, experience than most American doctors with this particular intervention, what is your view about how interesting, how good, and how useful is Duopa for late-stage patients? So late-stage uh, Parkinson's disease, we're usually beyond the stage of the conventional um, oral medications, and we're into um, a three-way uh, choice between surgery, apomorphine, and Duodopa. Um, the um, advantages of surgery have been well documented recently in late disease, although not in early disease, um, and in, apomorph in the use of apomorphine similarly, there's an evidence base growing. I think the latest research actually is from the U.S. Um, because it was licensed many years ago in Europe without necessarily those trials, but um, it's a very effective and um, very well-used drug. Duodopa has many years of experience, but not that many cases. Uh, my own use of it has been very successful. Um, the um, drug that is in the cassette that is uh, infused through a um, jugional tube, a tube that looks very much like a feeding tube, is actually the same uh, drug that's in Cinemet. It's, it's Cocarol Dopa um, and is a very sophisticated, although rather large, uh, cassette um, uh, that gets into the um, body in a nice steady level. It's absorbed in a nice steady way and therefore the theory is it gets into the brain in a nice steady way. Um, if I have a criticism of it, it's the size of the, of, of the, um, uh, of the infusion box, which um, women tend to carry in a sort of little handbag. Men tend to carry as almost as like a sh shoulder holster. Um, and I think um, the tube system that administers it, it could probably do with a little bit of development. Um, to my, in my practice, it's been um, sometimes problematic, needs changing a few times, but uh, others I know have had trouble-free experiences of it. It's a cracking drug if, you can, um, if it can be used in, 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 um, in a way that is patient-friendly and physician-friendly. You need nurses to help you with, and the company that supply Duodopa do have a, a workforce of nurses that do that. The, um, the, the, the block in um, certainly the UK has been the cost. It's been quite expensive, and that's something that characterizes drugs perhaps that aren't being used um, as frequently as others. Uh, I hope the price drops because um, I think it's a useful addition. Great. We're already past past our hour, but I can't resist one more question, and I have a, a small uh, uh, some administrative stuff to cover in another few minutes. So if you can please hold on the line for a few more minutes, all of you. Um, one more question. This is also from one of these brainy Californians. They want to know about the impact on long-term progression with deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation being something that's usually done later on in the condition. And what do we know, Dr. Fletcher, about the um, impact, about, uh, given that we've had thousands of cases studied over 20 years, uh, what do we know about the impact of uh, deep brain stimulation surgery uh, on the later uh, years of progression of Parkinson's? Uh, in terms of disease modification, there is none. Um, in terms of quality of life, of course, deep brain stimulation has been revolutionary in terms of giving people um, dyskinesia-free life to take more of the oral medication. So um, it's always this conundrum in Parkinson's disease between what is the disease and what, is, what are the symptoms. So DBS, I think, is, is, is a fabulous treatment. I think the, the world has moved on to some extent. Um, here in the west of England, we're trialing um, a drug called um, glial-derived nerve growth factor, which is actually um, part of a U.S. study. Um, and um, this looks at actually trying to um, help cells that might be dying um, not to die so that actually there is disease modification. Now, that's in a very early stage, and um, that, together with the um, some of the uh, um, cell-based studies that are being done in Cambridge um, may yet um, give an answer to that question in terms of improving not just survival but improving um, disease-free or disease-reduced survival. Very, very early days. And it's a great question because DBS has been around for a long time and um, uh, pallidotomy before that, the lesioning studies. But to date, um, the recommendation is that DBS should not be done early um, it does not offer um, disease modification uh, benefit, uh, but it's a great uh, therapy for advanced disease if, if, if indicated. 
Just terrific. Before I give you a final thank you and uh, applause on the part of all of us listening, there's a few bi- uh, business matters for our guests on the call. Um, first of all, I want to repeat the uh, continuing education unit's comment at the beginning. At least one person called in. Wasn't quite sure what we said there. Um, for those of you who told us you want CEUs, you will be um, receiving an email from Valerie in our office here later on today or this evening, whatever your time is. So please watch for that. should have the instructions in it. If, if for some reason you don't know, understand them or they're not clear, do give us a call on the 800 number, 1-800-457-6676. Um, and speaking of the um, 800 number, um, we um, – what was the other thing I was doing? Uh, no, I was – Come back to those things. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, forgive me. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, there's an online survey on your screen, um, which, uh, it, excuse me, a bit of background noise there. Is that at your end, Dr. Fletcher? No, no. I'm, um, I'm all quiet. We seem to have a third party who is uh, breaking into the place, except they've stopped. Thank you for stopping. <laughs> now, <laughs> now it's easier. Um, so uh, for the online survey, it should be on the screen now. If you'd kindly um, uh, answer that, um, we take your feedback very seriously, and I mean uh, folks here actually do count responses, uh, organize them in some way, feed them back into our planning process so that we really do actually use these uh, responses in each and every webinar to make sure that we're giving you the most relevant things next time around. So please do spend that few minutes necessary to do that. Um, I want to thank again our two corporate sponsors. Uh, Abvi Incorporated and Acadia Pharmaceuticals, both Abvi and Acadia, good friends of this movement and uh, very good supporters and friends of this series of expert briefings that you're enjoying today. So once again, thank you to Abvi and Acadia. Uh, there will be an archive of today's event, which will be available starting next week, exactly one week after this um, uh, presentation, Tuesday, June 30th. Uh, it'll be available at www.pdf.org. Um, it's www.pdf.org. We will send you an email with a link when it's available so that you can listen to the talk again, or of course let your friends and family uh, listen to it too. Um, if you did not get your question answered, I can see a small pile of yellow slips that were not answered. Um, please call our 800 number, 1-800-457. 6676, and Linda or Jill, one of our uh, very expert and loving uh, counselors, uh, will answer with their usual care and authority, and we'll be happy to do that. So um, if you don't mind us imposing the extra burden on you of calling in, at least we'll make sure we get your questions straight, um, which is the main reason I'm giving this, rather than just laziness at our end. Um, so please do call in and give uh, Linda and uh, Jill your question, and they will do their best, usually a very good best to answer it. Um, We do have uh, one more announcement here. The next expert briefing, the beginning of our new series for 1516. It'll be on Tuesday, as always, September 15. It'll be from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern United States time, um, as always. And it will be on the topic of nutrition and Parkinson's disease. We're going to be taken care of uh, in this occasion by Dr. Heather Zwicky, who is of the National College of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, which is also, incidentally, um, I believe just incidentally, the site for the next World Parkinson Congress taking place in September 2016, um, which is also run by Eli Pollard, who's running this series of, of, uh, of, of webinars. She seems to do everything around here. Um, and uh, that, will be in, uh, uh, that will be on September 15th. And Dr. Swicky would love to have you in the audience for that on one of everybody's uh, most important topics, nutrition. So that's for this. Thank you for letting us out say our welcome. And uh, particularly, thank you to Dr. Fletcher for such rich, thoughtful, uh, complex answers, but very simply delivered on so many different topics. Um, as you know, we give him no notice as to what these questions are going to be. The entire thing is live, and uh, so it was just uh, answering um, ad lib and doing it extremely well and very, very clearly. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher, for doing us proud on one of the most important and uh, forbidding topics within Parkinson's, beautifully handled. And, uh, and I, we all, if you could hear them all, cheer 
and clap. They can't do that because the technology doesn't allow that. But there would be a large chorus of applause from end to end of the continent and several other continents too. Thank My you pleasure, again. Robin. Have a wonderful summer, all of you. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. And join Thank us you, again on the 15th. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher.